Welcome to SBNM is Here, the State Bar of New Mexico's official podcast. In this series, we'll discuss topics such as professional development, tools of the legal trade, and mental and professional well-being. Connecting the legal community across New Mexico, SBNM is here. If you haven't listened to our first few episodes, they will be available on the listening platforms of Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube, as well as our website. Make sure to subscribe on your preferred platform to receive notifications when a new episode is ready. So as we're settling into this podcast, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone for their feedback and suggestions thus far. This was a a very large endeavor, but really only came to fruition because of you all, the membership. We hope to be able to record in person soon with some beautiful and shiny new microphones, so please bear with us a bit longer on the audio. Uh, But in the meantime, please continue to respond to our survey found at nmbar.org backslash podcast. We've already received a dozen of new episode ideas, including construction law, health law, and solo and small firm operations, just to name a few. This episode will be sharing tools of the trade. Today, we'll continue with the Young Lawyers Division sub-series of What I Wish I Knew. Our presenters will be Allison Block Chavez, the current YLD Chair, and Tomas Garcia of Module Sperling, and a previous YLD Chair. Allison and Tomas, thank you so much for being here, and feel free to introduce and take it away. Thanks, Morgan. Hello, and welcome to the Young Lawyers Division podcast series, What I Wish I Knew. I'm Allison Block Chavez, the New Mexico State Bar's YLD Chair. In this podcast series, we talk to experienced practitioners about what they wish they knew when they began their careers. Our guests talk about their experiences as a young lawyer and give insight and advice on day-to-day relationships, money, balance, and growth. Today, I'm very excited about our guest today. He's a close personal friend of mine, and we also served on the Young Lawyers Division Board. So our guest today is Tomas Garcia from the Madril Sperling Law Firm. Welcome, Tomas. Thank you, Allison, and thank you so much for inviting me to join you today for the discussion, and I'm very happy to be here. Well, great. Well, I'm going to introduce you and tell everyone why, well, some of the reasons why you're so great and give them a bit of your background. So Tomas is an Albuquerque native. He went to Yale University for undergraduate, for his undergraduate degree. He went to Harvard for his master's in public policy, and he went to Georgetown University for law school and his Juris Doctorate. After law school, he was an associate at the Miller Stratford firm. He then served as a law clerk to the Honorable Justice Charles Daniels at the New Mexico Supreme Court. He then took an associate position at the Module Sperling Law Firm in Albuquerque. And today he is a current shareholder. His practice includes commercial, healthcare, personal injury, and transportation litigation. Tomas is pretty busy outside of work as well. Uh, Since being admitted to the bar, he's been very active with the State Bar and the American Bar Association, as well as community activities. Currently, Tomas serves as a commissioner on the State Bar of New Mexico's Board of Bar Commissioners, which is the State Bar's governing body. He's also active with the ABA's litigation section. And he's a founding member of the Albuquerque Collegiate Charter School. And as I mentioned before, he also served as the chair for the Young Lawyers Division Board. He's also received many accolades for his work and commitment to to the community and the legal profession, including the ABA On the Rise Top 40 Young Lawyers Award. He was a Top 40 Lawyer Under 40 by the Hispanic National Bar Association. He was an Albuquerque Business First 40 Under 40 honoree and uh, the Young Lawyer of the Year for the New Mexico Defense Lawyers Association. So Tomas has a lot of great experience. He's an asset to our community and our legal profession, and I'm excited to talk to him today. Thank you for that kind introduction. (laughs) Of course. So I'm just going to jump in. this is our second our second interview doing this series, What I Wish I Knew. And we we cover the same four topics, getting different perspectives from each each person we interview. So we're gonna start with day-to-day relationships. 
And I know I always, um, when I think about a, a law firm like Module Sperling, which is one of the largest law firms in the state, um, as a young lawyer, that's pretty intimidating starting out. So can you talk a bit about your experiences as a young lawyer, maybe working with the other attorneys or your supervising attorney when you started at Modrel? Um, absolutely. So um, as you've mentioned in my introduction and certainly just now, I, I began my career as a lawyer in a law firm setting. Um, uh, worked at a couple of different uh, law firms and also clerking at the New Mexico Supreme Court. But um, in particular, uh, to your question about my interactions with supervising attorneys in the law firm setting, I, I think especially for young lawyers that find themselves uh, in practice settings uh, at, at law firms, uh, you'll find that most of your um, interactions, uh, or, or rather, you don't necessarily have direct interaction with, um, with clients but rather most of your interactions are with supervising attorneys. Um, I always sort of approached my interactions with um, supervising attorneys as if they were my clients because I was doing work product, a research memo, a draft of a pleading or a motion uh, directly for that supervising attorney. And so I, I wanted to make sure that as my client, they were happy with the work product, um, that, that I understood what the question they were presenting to me was that, that I um, was getting all the information that I needed to in order to provide a, a thorough and thoughtful analysis um, and that you open or, and maintain open communication uh, with the supervising attorney so that, that uh, it's very clear what it is that they're asking you for and that, that the product you deliver is ultimately something that they're going to be satisfied with. Um, uh, as I'm sure a lot of young attorneys experience early in their careers um, working with, with different people, um, you know, partners in law firms are, are not unlike um, other types of clients you'll, you'll face or, or encounter, meaning that they'll have different demands, different expectations, and different working styles. Um, and so it's, it's just very important to be um, flexible and, and kind of get to know your supervising attorney as much as possible and get to know what their working style is like so that you can best adapt to it and, and provide, you know, written product uh, or, or any kind of work product that, that they're going to be satisfied with. Yeah, I think that's a, a good way to think about it, that your supervising attorney is your client and you want to make sure you're giving them the best uh, best work product as possible. What about when, now that you're a shareholder, you're probably interacting a lot more with clients, um, but, but before that, what approaches worked for you to make sure you were providing the best legal representation for your clients? I always thought that it was important to be thorough with my analysis. Um, I always tended to err on the side of, of, of kind of providing too much information um, or at least going out and finding, you know, what is the applicable law uh, on a set of issues that you're, you're faced with and then to just be as thorough with the analysis as possible. Something that, and, and I think my experience was that, you know, early on before I necessarily understood what a client's, um, you know, business, uh, looked like or, or how a particular legal issue might affect them from a business perspective, I always kind of went out of my way to um, overanalyze questions from a legal perspective and to provide as much, um, you know, in-depth analysis as possible. Uh, as I got more experience or got to work with the same type of clients uh, or, or clients in the same kind of industry group uh, more and more throughout the years and I understood more about the business interests, you end up being in a position of being able to tailor um, more what what you think the um, you know the useful information could be for your client. Um, I think it's okay, uh, and certainly when I work with younger attorneys now, I, I prefer to have you know a research memo that is longer than what I've asked for, and that that covers more um, issues or gets more in depth than what I necessarily asked for at the outset. It's always easier to scale back than it is to have you know a supervising attorney come back to you and say, you know we're, we're missing. A, B, and C, or we're missing this piece, can you go back and, and look at this further? And so as far as, especially starting out, I think the, the best way to provide, um, you know, uh, good work product is to just be as thorough as possible. And then once you get to know the client better, or once you get to know the supervising attorney better, um, you're able to kind of fine tune or hone uh, what the question is or, or what the, the relevant um, scope of the issue should be. 
Well, I'm probably being over over prepared or having the, that extra research or backgrounds helpful when you have to then go interact with opposing counsel or, or go to a hearing. Can you tell us a bit about any experiences you've had working um, with opposing counsel and, and and what those experiences were? Um, certainly. So in my, my practice area is, is litigation and of course litigation being an adversarial type system. So we're always taking uh, opposing positions and dealing with opposing counsel, um, whether it's in briefing a, a motion, um, whether it's in, in negotiating a settlement um, or preparing for and participating in a trial. Um, it, so, uh, you know, being in litigation and being in the adversarial system, it, 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 it is, I think people are, are sometimes primed to be um, um, trying, to, trying to find the right word because there's adversarial, which is necessarily what litigation is, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be um, difficult with people or that you can't be friendly with people. And I think that's been one of my favorite things about practicing law in New Mexico is that, um, you know, we have such a, a small and, and for the most part, very collegial bar. Um, and I think it's important to maintain good relationships with opposing counsel because they're people that you see over and over again. Um, uh, does it happen all the time that you're necessarily best friends with opposing counsel? No, of course, but um, I think it, it makes for a more productive working relationship when you can, um, you know, be open and, and collegial, even if you're necessarily engaged in an adversarial um, posture as a litigant. Um, I, I think one of my, my favorite experiences with opposing counsel pretty early on in my career, um, I got to work on a case that subsequently ended up going to trial and, and it ended up being my first uh, civil jury trial uh, was within the first year that I was at um, Module Sperling. And I, I was given the opportunity to handle most of the fact witness um, depositions uh, that occurred down in Las Cruces. And so while I was based in Albuquerque, um, the, the fact witnesses were all based in Las Cruces. And uh, me and, and opposing counsel, it was the same, same lawyer on the other side who ended up handling most of the depositions for the plaintiff. Um, but he and I got to, because we were interacting with each other day in, day out over many, many weeks, um, developed a really good rapport with each other. Um, I, I remember at one point his, uh, uh, I think it was his air conditioner had, had gone out on his vehicle, which um, being in Las Cruces in the summer, uh, it's not a great time to have your air conditioner uh, <laughs> malfunction. So he needed to take his car in for service and he needed a ride back from the shop. And so I was uh, perfectly willing to, to help give him the ride. I'm sure that if I had been in that kind of situation, I would have been able to ask him uh, for a similar favor. And I'm sure he would have, um, uh, you know, been as gracious and 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 help me out in in my time of need as well. Um, I remember having lunch with him actually. I think it was either on the way to the uh, on the way to pick up his car or on the way back. But I remember stopping and having lunch with him and and just thinking like what a what a good um, place this is to be able to practice law. Where even though doing the day in day out function of of litigation, you can still have a collegial relationship with the person that is your adversary um, professionally. Oh, that's a that's a great point that just probably you were a good guy to him and so you that probably helped your case get move along and plus it makes makes your life a little easier when you're not going head to head with your opposing counsel. Um, last on this subject, so you and you clerked for a New Mexico Supreme Court justice. So probably early on in your career, you were at least in the Supreme Court room um, pretty often. But once once you left that, did that experience help you um, be more comfortable in the trial courtroom once you were you were practicing and working at Modrel? Absolutely. Um, when I talk to law students who are um, contemplating, you know, whether they want to go straight into private practice um, or straight into practice of law, whatever that um, setting might be, um, or if they're contemplating doing a judicial clerkship. I, I found my experience as a judicial law clerk to be um, invaluable uh, to what I do as a, as a private practice uh, litigator, but I, I can see how the experience would be um, universally valuable. And so I always um, you know, encourage law students to think about pursuing a clerkship if they're not already thinking about it. 
and if if they are already thinking about it i i'm a big proponent of judicial clerkships because i think they enhance your experience as a lawyer significantly um in, in my case um i i can say that it definitely helped me to be a much um, more thorough and more efficient uh researcher um it's helped me to be uh, much more attentive to detail in drafting pleadings and motions. Um, I think it helped strengthen my writing abilities. Um, certainly one of the things you do as a law clerk is you draft something and then you edit it. Um, you review other people's writing and you edit that. Um, and you learn a lot about the editing process in much more detail than what I think you're taught in law school and probably what, what you experience in, in most um, practice settings. And so having that level of um, uh, uh, level of attention to detail is something that I, I, I think I picked up through my clerkship uh, experience. And, and probably the most valuable part of it was having the opportunity to observe um, oral arguments um, on a monthly basis, um, getting to see you know, the, the best of the best um, advocacy from, from lawyers in our state presenting at the New Mexico Supreme Court. Um, making arguments, standing on their feet, and fielding questions from uh, the justices um, was truly an invaluable opportunity for me to learn um, what it takes to, to present an effective argument um, and how to be able to, um, you know, confidently uh, respond to questions when they're being thrown at you rapid fire uh, mode from, from uh, a hot bench, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, the, the mentorship component of a clerkship was something that um, has just served me immensely. Even after leaving the court, I maintained a very wonderful relationship with the, the justice that I worked for, which is, uh, of course, Justice Daniels, who, who was, I, I can think of no finer um, mentor to have had uh, as a young lawyer than him. Um, but I certainly know many people who've worked as judicial law clerks uh, for many judges who all speak highly of their experience, and, and that's probably the, the thing that they um, look back on most fondly is the, the mentorship relationship that they develop with with uh, with their judges. Yeah, I, I clerked too, and and I had a very similar experience. I was at the Court of Appeals, and having that opportunity to sit in the courtroom and watch watch lawyers do their work was was great. It allowed me to say, I want to do that. I don't want to <laughs> do that. Um, and also picked up some skills. So we're going to talk about money in just a minute uh, right after this break. The Solutions Group, the State Bar of New Mexico's EAP provider, offers confidential, free professional counselors to support employees and their direct family members by offering short-term counseling, assessments, and referrals for any life struggle. This includes drug addiction, relationship conflict, anxiety, depression, grief and loss, and other services include dependent care, crisis management and intervention, educational presentations, free well-being webinars, and online stress assessment tools. If you're interested, call 505-254-3555 or 1-866-254-3555. And identify with NMJ Lab to schedule an appointment, appointment or video visit. Let's talk a bit about money, and let's let's talk about billables. I I have to do my point ones and point twos at my job, and that was something I was. I had a lot of anxiety about in law school or preparing for my job is just I didn't know what that meant or how to do it or whether I could meet my expectations. So what were your some of your initial experiences with, with billable hours and what what did you do to make sure you met your firm's expectations? Um, sure. So of course working in, in a private practice setting, everybody is aware that that's just the nature of how firms work and how lawyers charge for their time is, um, you know, in, in um, increments of, you know, one-tenth of an hour. Um, I remember thinking at, at the beginning, or I remember feeling at the beginning of my, my career that tracking billable time was rather tedious and having to, you know, write down um, six-minute increments of, of your day was a, a, a kind of a slog. 
Um, quite honestly, though, in practice, I think it just became, it got to a point where it just becomes second nature. Um, and if anything, it's, it, it, I sort of appreciate that it, it kind of helps you to stay accountable for what you've accomplished at the end of the day. Um, there is something gratifying of, about looking back at your day and saying, you know, this is what I, this is what I did with my time. Um, I worked on this brief or researched this issue or, um, you know, prepared a memo on this topic, drafted a correspondence, um, communicated with these clients or, or these opposing counsel. Um, so there's something, I think, beneficial to being able to track your time. Um, it does take some getting used to, though, because I, I don't think in very many other professional settings uh, do you actually have to account for your time in, in that level of detail. Um, but it's just sort of what we do. Um, I think there is, I've heard discussion or, or um, uh, conversation about, you know, the industry may be moving away from uh, billable hour systems and maybe more towards, um, uh, oh, I don't know what alternative billing arrangements there may be. I would say that in my, in my experience uh, in litigation doing mostly civil defense work, um, I, I don't see billable hours going away anytime soon. Um, it's just the system that our, our clients expect and, and use, and it's the manner in which we do business. Um, as to your question, Allison, I think about, um, you know, how did I, um, uh, how, how did I go about meeting my billable hour expectation? Um, I never, I never really found it to be um, too much of a challenge. I, I think for me, um, when I was in law school, I went to law school, as you mentioned, at, at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and a lot of my classmates in law school uh, that stayed in D.C. Or, or went to other large markets like New York or Los Angeles um, went to work for large firms where the norm was probably, you know, in excess of 2,000 hours a year, maybe more along the lines of 2,200 or more. Um, when I came to New Mexico, and I, I knew that I wanted to practice in New Mexico, and I, I spent all my summers working um, in New Mexico and, and working towards finding a job here post-law school, um, the, the expectation among uh, private employers in New Mexico was more along the lines of 1,800 hours a year, which right off the bat just seemed like a, a much more attainable billable hour requirement. And, and like I said, in my experience, um, I, I've not had difficulty um, meeting that hourly requirement. Basically what 1,800 hours a year works out to is around 150 hours a month. Um, or roughly 37 and a half hours per week, billable, of, of course, um, which means that not every waking moment you spend in the office is always necessarily billable. You might spend, you know, um, 10 hours in the office on a particular day, but only bill six hours, for instance. It just depends. And I think that, you know, with more experience, you end up becoming more efficient uh, with your time so that you're able to capture more of it as billable time. And that's something that's difficult, at least early on, is learning to be efficient and learning to cut out, you know, the, the unnecessary breaks or the amount of time that you spend shifting between assignments or between tasks where you're losing time. That's something that I think you just get better at with more and more experience. Um, one of the things that I, I did like about the billable hour um, model um, at, at the, the places where I've worked is that there's flexibility to it. And so, for instance, while, you know, the expectation might be that you should generally bill around 150 hours a month, um, some months you just don't hit that. You know, some months maybe you have a lot going on personally or you have, you, you take some time off because you decide to. Um, you can make up that time in a subsequent month. Um, or, you know, if you have a hard time meeting your hours during the week, you can work on the weekend. Um, so I always found that I, I, I had options for when I got work done, as long as I was getting my tasks done on time and providing drafts to my supervising uh, attorneys or getting things filed by appropriate deadlines, um, I had flexibility to get the billable time done when it best suited me. And so I, I've always appreciated that about, um, you know, the, the billable hour requirement uh, at my firm. And certainly it was like that at, at the, the other firms that I've worked at. So there. It, it can be tedious and it's a little bit hard getting used to, but I think billable hours become somewhat second nature. Um, they're helpful to keep you accountable for how you spend your time. Um, there's flexibility to it. And, and ultimately at the end of the day, it's, it's, 
I think it's good to have something to measure your productivity against. Yeah, I think you always um, talk to people and, and there's always this complaint among lawyers about having to bill a time or meeting billable expectations. But the first couple of years, I agree, it's hard to it's hard to get that figured out and to know what you're billing for or um, or to to capture your time, but but like with a lot of things you get more experience and you don't have to you're not doing the same task or you're not doing a task for the first time you're starting to do tasks for a second third fourth fifth time and so you can be more efficient and you have more of an idea of what that certain task should take how long it should take how much you should bill for it and i think that makes a difference when when you get to be a bit more experienced in meeting your billables um yeah, and I, I think there might be some changes coming down the road with, with billables. I think I agree with litigation. It's There's probably not really a change. But for other areas, flat fee billing is is a new approach. I do a lot of flat fee billing at my firm um, when when we have forms. And again, doing the same task, we know what, what to charge for that. And a lot of times, clients like that because there's no surprises on their bills. They know... I'm getting this document, it's going to cost X amount, I'm good with that. But with litigation, it's just hard hard to know what's going to happen. Exactly. So, yeah. So now you're a partner at your firm. Congratulations. I think that's as of January 1st of this year. Um, have there been any aspects of the business of the law firm that have been a challenge for you now that you're in this role? COVID-19. <laughs> I think that's been a challenge for everybody. No, and, and I say that somewhat facetiously. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, yes, you're right. I, I made partner at my firm and, and became partner effective January run of this year. Um, it, it has been a difference in the sense that um, I, I do have more direct client interaction and certainly responsibility on a number of matters. Um, than I did when I was an associate. Um, generally, um, I would say being responsible for your own workload and responsible for reporting updates to clients, that's something that is new with the territory as a, as a partner. Um, the, the, you know, the, the big blow that coronavirus uh, has dealt to um, pretty much every um, aspect of our lives, uh, it, it certainly um, has had an effect on um, the way our, our firm is managed on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I'm more involved in that now, or I, I have more access to information about things that are going on than I did as an associate. Um, but certainly, you know, you're aware of, of your clients' um, concerns and um, issues that they're facing. And generally, uh, litigation is something that makes everybody anxious. And having this additional level of uncertainty added to you know, what's going on in the world on a day-to-day -day basis just sort of adds to your client's sense of anxiety. Um, and so I've had to, you know, work on negotiating that uh, with various clients and, and, and had to work with, you know, the courts um, figuring out how they're going to conduct business um, on, a, on a daily basis and, um, and have to explain that to clients and kind of talk them through the process more than, um, Certainly more than I did as an associate, but I think more in particular this year than what what anyone has ever had to do because we're just all facing such new circumstances at the moment. So with that in mind, do you see any opportunities for law firms to innovate for the future? Um, absolutely. I think um, something that that you know we're I'm seeing at my firm right now is you know everybody had to make the transition rather quickly to. Um, working remotely. And for years, um, attorneys at my office have had the capability to work from home or to work remotely if they were traveling, for instance. But I don't know how widespread uh, it, it was done, practically speaking. Um, so, you know, once the, the governor's orders uh, on, on social distancing and closing workplaces went into effect earlier this year, um, our firm very quickly um, had to adapt and, and become a, a work from home um, kind of a platform for, for everybody to be able to, to have access to 
equipment and, and, and our systems to be able to do our work remotely. And I think what we found uh, was that everybody was able to make the transition. So lawyers and non-lawyer staff alike, um, we basically through, through technology are able to do what we do from the office um, from remote uh, settings. Um, it's not to say that, that that came without, you know, some difficulty um, from a lot of people, but I, I think that now that we're, you know, five, six um, months into the process, I think everybody is adapting and becoming much more efficient um, with remote, uh, uh, with, the, with the tools that we have available to do our work remotely. And so I, I, I would certainly anticipate that um, you know, this experience is probably common at, at other law firms and other, um, um, you know, law, law practice settings uh, across the state and across the country. And, and it wouldn't be surprising to me to, to, to know that law practices are looking at ways to um, either become completely uh, remote in nature or to downsize their, you know, um, their corporate office, you know, footprint. Um, but I think there are real opportunities for uh, for us as lawyers, and certainly I think we're lucky as a as a profession to be able to continue to be productive, to be able to continue doing what we do um, with relatively minimal interruption um, because of uh, of you know the the pandemic circumstances that we all find ourselves in now. Yeah, it's a new world, and I think it's giving us an opportunity to do our work and serve our clients in new ways. And I think I think it's good that we have an opportunity to rethink things and see see what works and what and realize what hasn't been working. One question I I like to ask people and and find out how they deal with it is their salary when they started working as a lawyer and dealing with student loans. Um, I know for me, I, that was a hard struggle after that six month uh, period after graduation expired and I had to start paying my loans. That was quite a shock. Can you talk a bit about your take home pay as a young lawyer and how you manage student debt and your personal finances? Sure. Um, I, you know, like many young lawyers, um, have, have had to deal with student debt, and I can attest, as everybody else certainly would, um, it's no fun. Um, and it is unfortunate, I think, that, you know, the cost of uh, uh, law school, the cost of, of college and, and post-college education is, is as expensive as it is. Nevertheless, um, I, I think the biggest thing in, in dealing with student debt and, and managing your um, you know, take home pay and making sure that you're able to meet your financial obligations. It's all about planning. Um, and one of the, in my experience, you know, I, I spent uh, a couple of summers working at law firms before I graduated from law school. I had an idea of what I would be earning as a first year attorney. Um, and so I was able to at least plan out and determine, you know, this is the budget that's going to work for me. Um, I'll be able to make this amount in payments and have this amount remaining um, in take home. Certainly, um, you know, you always wish that you have more money to work with at the end of the month, um, but it's just a matter of planning, um, really. One of the challenging things, I think, um, in private practice in New Mexico in particular, as compared to, say, law practice, um, private practice in other big markets, is that um, you can only plan so far in advance. And by that, I mean, um, so looking at large markets like Los Angeles or New York, there are resources available to law students. Um, uh, it's, there's an organization called NALP, N-A-L-P, and I, I, offhand I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but NALP has a database or had a database that would basically show you, um, you know, what, what is take home salary look like for a first year uh, lawyer in this market. Um, uh, or certainly, you know, with big national firms, it, it, you can figure out or find information um, readily available that shows you what the pay scale at the different firms look like. And all of these firms that generally follow the market rate pay along the same, you know, lockstep procedure for first year through, say, eighth year associates. 
Um, in, in New Mexico or in a market like New Mexico that's smaller and doesn't necessarily, um, you know, uh, adhere to the pay scales that you see in larger markets, it was a little bit more unpredictable because although I knew what it would look like for a first year associate, um, you know, what, what take home pay would look like for a first year associate, I wasn't sure what it would look like as a second year, third year, fourth year, uh, and so on down the road. Um, and that information is hard to get. Um, so I, I don't know that there's any any way you can prepare for that other than to say, you know, if you're able to, you know, anticipate what your debt load will look like, um, anticipate what your living expenses will look like, and if, you know, you're, you're, you're able to have the lifestyle you want to have with a first-year uh, associate's um, salary, um, you can anticipate that, you know, pay goes up from there and things get a little bit easier uh, the further you get along and the more debt you pay off. One of the, one aspect of, oh. of, uh, of compensation that I don't think I, I appreciated well enough as a, as a first year attorney or maybe even as a second year attorney was um, benefits. Um, and so I think there's, there's sometimes there's a lot of focus on take home pay and like the actual money that you get in your bank account um, through direct deposit or from a paycheck. Um, but one, one factor that I think young attorneys often overlook is um, benefits that a firm provides, so non-monetary benefits, but by that I mean, you know, health insurance. Um, there's a wide range of, of um, health benefits that different employers offer, um, 401k or retirement options. Um, some places can be very generous about that, some places less so. Um, uh, you know, there's all, all aspects of, of uh, additional benefits that I, I think a lot of times first-year attorneys or, or even uh, law students who are interning at different practice settings might not even think to ask about. Um, uh, CLE allowances, um, things of that nature. So I think it's important to get as, as, as complete a picture as you can uh, if you're a law student who's working for an employer over the course of the summer, other than, you know, the, the paycheck that you get. How else do they treat their first year attorneys? What other benefits do they get? Um, what do those benefits look like over time? Um, I think are important questions for law students who are considering uh, different employers to, to find out. Let's talk a bit about balance, which to me includes managing work and time um, and your professional life and your personal life. So at work, what approaches have you implemented to manage your time and your workload to make sure that you complete your tasks? That's a good question. And I, I think it's, um, you know, time management is something that I think it, it it's a skill that Everybody, something different works differently for everyone, I think. Um, uh, I, I find that I tend to be most productive early in the day. Um, so for me, morning hours are really good time for me to make significant progress on, say, like if I'm drafting a motion, I'm more likely to, you know, make more headway in drafting a brief if I start in the morning than if I start in the afternoon. So I'll try to order the tasks that I have to get done on a particular day, um, you know, based on how much brain power it might take to, for me to accomplish it. Um, I'll, I'll tend to put things that are harder for me to do in the morning, knowing that I'm going to be most productive in the morning. Um, one thing that I, I have done throughout my, my time uh, in practice is I, I, I always take a lunch break. Um, I, I like having my day broken up, you know, morning and afternoon. Um, I like socializing. Um, that's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite things about working in a in a law office that has you know dozens of people to interact with. Um, and so I would always um, find somebody to go to lunch with. And I think it's just helpful to take a break from whatever you're working on and 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 step away, go outside, go to a break room and have lunch there if you can't get out of the building. Um, but I always found it really important for me to take the hour long break um, in the middle of the day and break up my day morning and afternoon. Um, 
one of the other things that I do to kind of manage my uh, my tasks, you know, when, when things get really busy, um, my my calendar on my computer, it, it can look overwhelming sometimes. There's just so many things uh, that get jammed into each day. Um, I do spend time and look at my calendar every morning and make sure that I'm, you know, uh, prepared to get done what has to get done that day uh, and that, you know, there's not any deadlines that are sneaking up on me. But one of the other things that I've always done, because sometimes it's easy to lose track of things when you're when you're just relying on an electronic calendar, is when I get, say, a, a, a brief comes in electronically that I have to respond to or uh, have to do a reply brief for, I will print it immediately when it comes in, and I'll handwrite on the top corner of the page when my response or reply is due. And then I keep a stack of, um, you know, hard paper copies uh, of papers on my desk next to my uh, computer, and, and I'll have them in the order in which they're due. And so that that's another way that, you know, even though I've got that same information on my Outlook calendar, um, I find it useful to have, you know, a, a visual, um, and it also kind of helps me gauge, you know, what my workload looks like. If the stack is really big, that means I've got a lot going on. Uh, when it starts dwindling down, you know, I've, I've got more flexibility and, and, and more availability to take on additional additional work if it's coming uh, coming in. So that's that's one of the things I've done that since I was a, a first year attorney, and it's something that I um, sort of still do. I, I do when I'm in the office and I have access to a printer. Although I have to say, now that I'm working remotely, um, it's harder for me to print things uh, so readily and, and keep a, a hard paper stack next to me. But if you have access to that kind of equipment, um, uh, it's a technique that was helpful for me and could be helpful for, for your listeners too. I have a similar approach. I have both a mix of an electronic task list and then a stack of documents that I've, I've got to um, respond to or, or act on. Um, and I agree with you that for me in the morning, that's if I've got to write something or review a contract or do something that takes a lot of brain power, I'm going to do it in the morning just so that I can focus on it. I might even turn off my phone um, so I can just really get that done. And then in the afternoon, I that's when I like to schedule meetings or take phone calls because those are usually shorter or don't take as much brain power to to figure out. So so we talked a bit about in the office. What about outside of the office? Do you do anything to 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 relax or even some people call it practice mindfulness? What what do you do to to stay focused and and also to make sure that your um focusing on, on where you are and not thinking about the office all the time? Um, sure. So, you know, for me, one of the, the one of the most important reasons why I came back to New Mexico after being away at school, you know, so far away for as many years as I was, is because it was really important for me to be close to family. Um, I grew up in New Mexico and all my, um, you know, my parents, sister, my niece, um, uh, they all live here in Albuquerque. And I feel very fortunate to, um, you know, be close to them, to have them around, and to um, spend time with them and enjoy their company. And so I, I do make time throughout the week to see my family as often as possible. Um, uh, I, I grew up uh, Catholic, and to me, my Catholic faith is very important to me, and I do spend time going to church on Sunday. Um, and so I, I, I'm certainly aware of, you know, the concept of, of mindfulness or um, meditation. It's something that I, I, you hear a lot about people focusing on, you know, just themselves, you know, paying attention to themselves and what their feelings are and, and, and you know, what, what their environment is. And I think that can be helpful for getting people to relax and, and just kind of centered and focused on something that's not a task that you're trying to perform. Um, I have to say, I, I don't necessarily do that on a, on a daily basis, but for me, I think going to church with my family um, once a week is something that, um, for one, it's something I enjoy doing. It's a way to spend time with my family, but it's also um, a way, I think, being, uh, being spiritual or re reflecting on, um, you know, uh, 
your religion or your faith or saying a prayer. Um, I think that's a way of being mindful. It's a way of focusing your attention on, um, you know, what's going on in your life and, and how to think about and process it. Um, and so to me, that's, that is something that I, I do. It's a, it's a weekly thing that I do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's important to, if there are things that are important for you about how you, um, you know, connect with loved ones and, and how you take care of yourself, I think it's important that you keep doing that. Um, no matter how busy you get, um, I think, you know, the, the, the profession that we're in is one that can definitely uh, take up a lot of your time and a lot of your attention. Um, and if you let it, it can be pretty all consuming. And so it's important, I think, to um, carve out space each, each day um, or throughout your week as, as works best for you um, to make time for those things and to focus on yourself um, uh, as much as you can. Taking a break is important, especially, like you said, our job can be all-consuming and we're often taking on other people's problems. So whether it's a lunch break or 15-minute break around the office to talk to folks, I, I agree. I think that's important just to let your brain rest and and to to get, get other thoughts going. Um, now, looking at the, at the long term, sometimes, you know, you've been, you just a partner, um, you've been practicing not quite a decade, but getting pretty close there. Did you, did you kind of um, chart your path to get where you were or, you know, looking back at your career, what were some ways um, that maybe can help that helped you gain perspective, and what are some ways that young lawyers can maybe look to the future without getting overwhelmed? Yeah, I um, I think it is uh, important to kind of keep a, a, a sense of what the what the long what the long perspective or the long view is on 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 your career and and to help you figure out how to accomplish it. Right, um, I think it's helpful to have a plan. Uh, to to sort of determine you know what is the goal that I want to accomplish and and what's required for me to get there, um, I think is absolutely essential. Um, looking back at at kind of my experience and what I what I've done for me, it was very important that I find people that I liked working with and who were good mentors for me. And I can I can say that every place that I've worked, um, I've I've been fortunate to have really really wonderful mentors um, and, and people who've helped kind of help me get to the place in, in my career where I'm at. Um, I think within the first couple of years uh, at, at my firm currently, uh, I decided that, you know, I, this is somewhere that I could envision for myself being a, a long term home for me professionally. And so you, you kind of just set out uh, as an associate in a law firm, if you've decided that's what you want to do uh, to work towards becoming a partner. Um, and, uh, I, I gather that every law firm does things differently. At my firm in particular, um, the, the expectations or the requirements, um, the path for partnership is fairly well defined. And so that, that was fortunate for me because it helped me to um, know, uh, you know what the expectations were so that I could develop my own plan for how to accomplish it. Um, generally at my firm, it's, it's expected that you work um, full-time seven, seven years uh, and generally that you meet the billable hour expectation every year, um, and then you're eligible for um, uh, for partner. And so um, definitely at the end of every year, one of the th one of the things that my firm does, we uh, invite attorneys to uh, complete a self uh, assessment of themselves and to kind of reflect back on the things they accomplished over the year. Um, the ways in which they uh, developed in certain practice areas, uh, and to express an interest in pursuing a particular practice area if they haven't had uh, exposure to it. Um, and I've always found that a really helpful uh, exercise at the end of every year uh, to look back, see what I accomplished, think about what I want to do in the next year, write it down, and then kind of come up with your own plan for how you're going to achieve it. Um, and certainly putting that in an assessment, a self-assessment that you then turn into a supervisor or a mentor, 
um, is helpful because then they can help you um, make those connections or they can help you figure out how best uh, you can accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. Um, so, you know, I, I think having, it's, a, it's very important to have a plan. It's very important to have uh, a sense of the long-term perspective of your career and what you want to do. It's important for you to reflect on it individually. I, and I would be a pr big proponent for people writing it down, you know, memorialize it, uh, and maybe even look back at your own assessment, you know, uh, six, seven months after you've written it, a year after you've written it, uh, and, and think about, you know, how are you progressing along your plan? And then most importantly, I think, share your plan with somebody. Share your plan with somebody who's in a position to help you accomplish it because you really can't do it on your own. Um, I mean, I think some people can. Um, it's hard. Uh, and I, I think um, the best way to accomplish it is, is with assistance. And so seek out those people who can assist you. If they're mentors, if they're supervisors, they could be friends. Maybe, you're, maybe your plan is to transition um, from one employer to another or from one practice setting to another. Um, and in that sense, I think it's especially important to tell people to talk to somebody uh, who can help you think through and, and figure out, uh, you know, what the best, uh, what, what your best move is. I like that idea of a self-assessment and memorializing it because you can reflect on the year and then create your goals for for the future. And that's actually a great segue into our next uh, topic discussion about growth, which we will talk about right after this message. Are you interested in participating in the SBNM is Here podcast? We would love to have you. It's as easy as recording from your office. All you need is an internet connection and a phone. To learn more, visit our website at nmbar.org backslash podcast. So talking about self-reflection and setting goals, um, a lot of times those goals you need to take action steps to, to be able to achieve them. And oftentimes it might be you doing your own push to take that next next step and promoting yourself. Um, Tomas, can you tell us about some, some experiences or ways that you had to promote yourself during your career to either get that job or, um, be, get a leadership role, for example, what did you do to promote yourself and create opportunities for yourself? Sure. Um, I think there's probably two different examples that I would think of, and, and I think um, I will try to talk about both of them. Uh, the first one having to do with kind of my day-to-day -day job as an associate, a litigation associate in private practice, um, kind of in reference back to what I was talking about earlier about uh, doing this end-of-year self assessment um, that is something that we do at our firm that I find to be a very helpful exercise. I think it's it's been really useful to um, take stock of the things that I did over the year, the things I enjoyed doing, things I maybe struggled with. Um, and so you can identify what it is that you want to get better at. What is it about a particular practice you want to get more experience um, in doing? Um, so for instance, it could be something like I want to take an expert witness deposition. I may have taken a lot of fact witness depositions, but have not yet had the opportunity to depose an expert witness, um, which is a very important skill to have as a litigator. Uh, and so just flagging it for your supervisor, flagging it even for yourself, and then making a concerted effort to, uh, when the opportunity presents itself, you know, be the, be the one to put yourself out there to say, hey, I'm, I'm capable of doing this. I haven't done it yet, but I, I, feel confident that I know the case well enough, I, I, I can get up to speed on the material, um, and I would like the opportunity. And so it's important for you to be able to speak up for um, and advocate for yourself to have opportunities, to have experiences you might not have had yet um, so that you can advance professionally. I think it's important to do that. And that's one way I think uh, of, of doing it is, is keeping a, uh, or taking an, an annual assessment and identifying those areas in which you want to grow, and then um, just kind of keep a, 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 a list of, of 
the tasks or experiences that you want to get and then advocate for yourself um, so that you can take advantage of those opportunities when they arise. Um, one of the other ways that I've um, uh, had to promote myself um, has been in my involvement or getting involved with uh, bar association activities. Um, you mentioned during my introduction that I am, uh, certainly I have been active with the state bar uh, with the Young Lawyers Division, having previously served as the, as the chair of the, the YLD um, some time ago. And um, I continue to serve on the state bar board of bar commissioners. Um, I'm also involved with the American Bar Association and have been for many years. Um, the way I, I got involved with these, or for, for me, it was important for me to get um, involved in state bar activities as a new lawyer because I, I felt when I came back to New Mexico, even though I grew up in Albuquerque, I went away for law school and had been away from New Mexico for a long time. I remember being sworn in as a new attorney, um, and I just had a sense that everybody in the room, or most of the people in the room, already knew each other. Um, many, uh, many young lawyers um, have the, the benefit of going to law school at the University of New Mexico, which is a wonderful place. Um, and they, I think their, their um, closeness as a, as a class in law school translates over into their experience as professionals. And that's a, a really, really wonderful thing for, I think, University of New Mexico law school graduates to have as a benefit is that they continue to be close um, as professionals uh, when they're practicing if they stay in New Mexico. Um, coming to New, to New Mexico from out of state um, and then taking the bar here, I felt like I needed to, I needed to do more right off the bat to be able to um, even a, approach the same level of familiarity with um, with other lawyers that were being sworn in. And so um, for me, I remember going to a, a young lawyers division, I think it was a welcome reception or a welcome happy hour, um, where number one, I just met a bunch of people that were really wonderful and very welcoming, and they made bar association involvement seem like it was something fun to do. And so I, I started out in it because it was something that just seemed enjoyable. Um, and then of course the, the added benefit of, of doing it was uh, what meant that I had the opportunity to interact with uh, young lawyers that I otherwise would not be exposed to and, and start getting to know the legal community in, in a way that I wouldn't otherwise do if I weren't engaged with bar service. Um, and so in order to continue along uh, uh, and identifying and pursuing leadership opportunities with uh, with the state bar uh, uh, young lawyers division, I had to promote myself. Um, I, I certainly had to get the buy-in from my employer uh, with my firm to make sure that they were okay with me pursuing it because certainly being involved with um, bar service and bar association leadership, it's, it can be time consuming um, and it can often require you to do things um, during the regular work day. And so it's helpful to have buy-in from your employer um, before you engage in that. And um, my firm was very supportive of it and very willing to, um, um, you know, support me and, and, and help me uh, uh, in pursuing the things that I wanted to do with, with Bar Association leadership. And so that, that was a way to start was to um, you know, ask my employers, you know, say, this is something I would like to do. Is the firm, would the firm support this? And with their blessing, I was able to, um, you know, seek leadership appointment on the, the Young Lawyers Division Board and then ultimately run for an elected position. And, uh, and then subsequently, when the opportunity arose, uh, run for a leadership position on the, the YLD Board. Um, and then I've continued doing that even today uh, when there was an opening on the, the state bar uh, Board of Bar Commissioners, uh, I, I sought uh, uh, an opportunity, saw an opportunity to run for uh, an elected position uh, and obtain that position. Um, but certainly, is, it's not something you do passively. Uh, you have to decide to put yourself out there. You have to decide to promote yourself um, to, to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Sometimes taking the first steps the hardest part, right? And you don't even know where that's going to take you, but sometimes taking that first step to get involved and then you see, once you're there, you see the path that you want to go on. 
um, that's kind of how I felt in joining the YLD too. So, Tomas, I know just because I know you and we're we're good friends and have spent um, many hours in meetings together. Um, tell us a bit about some of your mentors that you've had during your career and how they helped you and why they've been so beneficial to you. Oh, um, I can't think of a place that I worked or uh, a bar association that I was involved in that I didn't have somebody that I absolutely relied on to help steer me through it um, and that I, I consider a mentor. Um, one of the ones who sticks out in my mind is um, Kea Cole, who um, was a, a YLD chair um, several years before me, and she is very well known to many um, members of the, the, uh, the profession here in New Mexico, but she is a huge advocate and always has been for promoting diverse lawyers and in, in our profession and any, promoting anybody who wants the opportunity to have the opportunity to take on leadership. Um, Kea is somebody who absolutely promoted my involvement with uh, the YLD, and uh, she introduced me to the American Bar Association uh, and, and helped me help plug me into uh, opportunities for leadership on a national level. Um, other than through uh, bar associations, I would say um, um, professionally, I didn't necessarily know what practice area I wanted to pursue, um, you know, in my private practice. For me, it was more important that I find people that I liked working with and who um, could could mentor me and kind of teach me how to practice law. And, and that sort of is how I've ended up in the practice areas that I do, is that I just ended up, um, you know, finding people at my firm that um, were wonderful to work with. Um, early on in my career, I can think of uh, Jen Hall, who uh, is a partner at Miller Stratford, who does um, primarily medical malpractice defense work. Um, I learned an incredible amount uh, from Jen um, in, in, in my early days as a litigator and, and certainly in my time at, at Miller Stratford. Um, obviously, Justice Daniels is somebody I would consider to have been a, a, an influential mentor uh, for me in the time that I clerked at the New Mexico Supreme Court. Um, and he's somebody that I kept in contact with, um, you know, for years after my clerkship um, and is somebody who, whenever I'm thinking of uh, a legal issue or analyzing a legal issue, uh, I try to approach it from all angles. And that's something that I learned from him. Um, in my current firm at Module Sperling, um, the first attorney I ever tried a case with was Alex Walker, who is uh, an absolutely tremendous litigator um, he gave me a lot of responsibility on, on the case that we were working on together and, and really gave me the opportunity to um, uh, thrive as a litigator um, and, and kind of put me in a position of, of being the person that knew all the facts about our, our, our client's position uh, so that I could play a significant role uh, when the case went to trial. Um, Michelle Hernandez is a, one of my partners now that I continue to work with on a daily basis and that I have learned a tremendous amount about um, in, in, in doing um, uh, defense work on behalf of uh, long-term care facilities, uh, senior care facilities and rehab uh, facilities. And she's somebody that, you know, I, has been a big proponent for me both at the firm and um, within professional organizations and, and is supportive of, you know, all the work that I do with the ABA, with the state bar, and um, uh, uh, with organizations promoting diversity in the legal profession. So um, that's one of the things that I've enjoyed so much about um, being a lawyer is that it, it's bigger than the work you do on a day-to-day -day basis at your own organization, right? I think being a lawyer means you're part of a profession and our profession does a lot. Um, you know, we do a lot for our clients, but we also do a lot um, in, in, in service to the public. Um, and, and I've enjoyed working with people and with mentors who've helped me advance, um, you know, professionally at my job on a day-to-day -day basis, but also um, who recognize that, you know, what we do as lawyers is, is kind of bigger than our day-to-day -day job, and, and they're supportive of, of, you know, those kinds of opportunities for, for me to 
give back and participate in bar association and activities. Awesome. So one, one, well, I guess two, two more questions for you. This last, second to last one, were there any risks that you took um, during your career that paid off or maybe didn't pay off, but you still took it? Um, yeah, I think the most obvious uh, risk, or at least it felt like a risk at the time, uh, was uh, deciding to leave private practice after a year to pursue a judicial clerkship. Um, I remember talking to my, my family, uh, my parents who are not lawyers, um, were a little bit confused when, when I told them that you know, I was gonna be leaving my law firm job to go work as a law clerk for a judge. I think my parents understood you know, what I was describing as this one year position. They, they thought I was doing an internship basically and were totally confused as to why anybody would give up a, a, a secure position to go do a one year internship and potentially not have the opportunity to return to that same job after a year. Um, it was also a little bit, um, at the time, I, I didn't know very many people who uh, pursued judicial clerkships after starting in private practice. And so it felt unconventional to me uh, to do it that way. But I'm so glad that I did. Um, to this day, I think my, my time uh, working as a law clerk at the New Mexico Supreme Court is, is one of the most rewarding um, and valuable um, uh, professional positions that I've ever held. Um, it taught me uh, an immense amount about the practice of law that I would never have had access to if I'd not pursued it. Um, and I think it, it's made me a better, um, it's made me a better lawyer and it's made me kind of more aware of, you know, what, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as lawyers, that it has bigger implications um, for um, for things, right? So any, any one case that you work on that, that uh, an appellate judge decides uh, has ramifications after that one case. And, and I think working as a law clerk or being in that setting kind of gives you an appreciation for that. Um, other risks that I've taken professionally, um, that's kind of the most obvious one, I, I think, that, that I think of uh, where it was, you know, leaving a, a position for another position and not knowing, you know, what, what the outcome uh, would look like is probably the, the biggest risk that I can think of offhand, but it was worth it. And I'm, I'm glad that, um, I'm glad I had the opportunity to do it. And I'm, I'm glad that I um, took advantage of the opportunity. Great. So that include that concludes my questions I have for you. Do you have any other um, words of wisdom or parting parting advice? Um, you know, I think it's a comment that I made earlier in reflecting about, um, you know, one of the benefits of being a lawyer in New Mexico is that this is such a collegial bar for the most part. And so, you know, parting words um, for for new lawyers today, I, I, I just ask you to um, be kind and, um, and, and, and get involved. Um, I think there's opportunity uh, in New Mexico um, in, in with the State Bar of New Mexico in particular to give back, to do public service, to um, connect with the profession in a way that's more than just, you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's rewarding. And, and I think if you do it, you'll, you'll find real value in, in uh, your day-to-day -day job, but also you'll just find a lot of personal satisfaction with it. And you'll get exposed to to lawyers that you don't get to deal with on a on a daily basis in in your in your everyday jobs, um, and I think that in itself lends itself to uh, making it a much more collegial profession. The more you get to know people on a personal level, um, uh, I think the the friendlier kind of a place uh, it, it becomes. Well, thanks so much, Tomas. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and share share your advice, share the things you've done over the course of your career to this point. We know you're just barely not a young lawyer anymore, so we know we're still going to be seeing you around. And and I personally look forward to seeing what you do because, like I said, you're an asset to our legal community. You provide so much of yourself and give so much of your time, and I really appreciate it, especially today by spending this 
this hour with us. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Allison. It's my pleasure. And thank you again for inviting me to join you. Thanks. Well, that's it for today's episode on what I wish I knew. I'm Allison Block Chavez, and we are working on a couple more episodes coming up. Um, two of our next guests, one is Asia Brooks, who's the director of the Center for Self-Help and Dispute Resolution at the Second Judicial District Court. We're going to be working on an episode um, interviewing her about her work, her kind of non-traditional role, and a lot of her work with um, the upcoming diversity survey that the state bar is doing. And another guest is Morris Chavez, who is near and dear to me personally, my husband. <laughs> He's currently the partner at his firm, Salcedo Chavez, and he'll talk to us about his long career, also a non-traditional path, and some of the, the work that he's doing with the state bar. So I hope you will join us for those. And if you've got any podcast ideas or want to reach out to the state bar, please do so. We always encourage feedback and your ideas. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for listening. This episode was produced by the State Bar of New Mexico's Member Services Department and Young Lawyers Division. All editing and sound mixing was done by Blue Sky eLearn. Intro music is by Kevin McLeod at ItComTech. The views of the presenters are that of their own and are not